Great. Uh, thank you, Gina. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. We uh, did not <laughs> anticipate this much interest. Um, our roundtables generally, I think at most, have had 12 to 15 people. <laughs> and we had apparently 115 people registered today. So we're going to see how this goes with this many people. Um, I think it'll be fine. Uh, but uh, my name is Jason Cruz. I am the undergraduate engagement librarian at Northwestern University. And I am the co-chair of um, Academic Outreach Committee. And I'm joined by my other co-chair, uh, Kristen Mastel, who is at uh, University of Minnesota. And she is backup facilitating today. And she will be taking notes. Um, we, <laughs> I, I hope uh, we don't run you ragged, Kristen. <laughs> it, um, if, uh, it, just in case uh, you came in just now, uh, this is being recorded. So if you don't feel comfortable being on camera, please feel free to, uh, you can mute your video. Um, we're, if you uh, have any questions, we're just kind of see how this goes. If you, if you wanna, uh, if you have any questions, if you have any comments to make, Go ahead and unmute yourself. I'm guessing there's going to be a little bit of people trying to talk at the same time. We'll, we'll just see how this goes. If you, if you have any comments or questions, you can also put them in the chat box as well. And uh, Kristen will be monitoring that and I will kind of keep an eye out as well. Um, so as uh, Gina mentioned, our topic today is on remote outreach and engagement. This was something that wasn't our intended uh, topic when we put it together in February, but we figured that this is probably more timely, uh, probably of more interest uh, at, at this point. So uh, we wanted to get a sense, and I, and I think uh, really for me personally, uh, this is something that we had to, uh, that is going to be new for us at Northwestern. We've done most of our, all, you know, for the last several years, almost everything's been in person. And uh, so, we are currently planning for the fall quarter, trying to figure out how this is all going to, to uh, work. Um, so with that, uh, we'll just get started. Um, to start out with, I just, I have a couple of prompt questions, but if you have things that you want to talk about, if, uh, things that you, you have questions about, uh, feel free to throw those in the chat box or, or just uh, unmute yourself and ask. But uh, as I mentioned, for, for some of us, uh, or maybe a lot of us, uh, most of our outreach and engagement activities is pro have probably been in person, but you know, the, it is a, a fact that there are a lot of online programs now at universities. So uh, there has probably been, <laughs> been some activity uh, in an online format. Uh, so for, for those of us who are trying to figure this out, um, is there, are there anybody, uh, is anybody out there who has uh, experience doing this already, doing uh, programs in, in an online format and wants to talk about successes or uh, challenges? Sure, I'll jump in. Uh, we attempted to do a virtual uh, iteration of our outreach event that we usually do during study days. And while we had a great program and we had awesome opportunities for students to engage, it was not well attended, um, mainly on the library side. We partnered with a number of uh, departments around campus, health and wellness, um, uh, Center for Learning and Creativity, and some of them had higher attendance. Uh, we also have a therapy dog and even our therapy dog didn't get a lot of attendance so we're still trying to figure out how to reach our students but i think the programming that we had set up was a good idea so it's just a matter of getting those two connected thank you anyone else had experiences with this we did something similar for our uh, finals week and uh, felt that it was somewhat successful. And one thing that we did was create a lib guide that had all sorts of resources. Uh, we had uh, live streaming puppy videos, live streaming otters, um, coloring pages, meditation, all that kind of stuff. And then our outreach librarian he went on Facebook Live throughout the day 
and so you know if you couldn't attend at one point you could attend at another point and we I don't, we didn't have much attendance at the Facebook Live, but we had a lot of hits on the LibGuide itself. So the LibGuide was really huge, and we're going to incorporate that when we are able to do this in person next time. We're still going to have that virtual component. Thank you. Oh, and a, and a chat popped up, and I forgot to say this before <laughs> we asked the question. Um, if you could just identify, uh, you know, just say what your name is uh, and what institution you're at. Sorry, my name's Kelly Hoppy, and I am from Cornet Library, West Texas A&M University in Canyon, Texas. Thank you. And my name is Crystal Young. I am a reference and instruction librarian at the University of Southern California. Hi, everybody. My name is Kate Krause. I'm with the MD Anderson Cancer Center uh, in Houston, Texas. We've tried a number of things and we found that uh, it took a while for students to be, to get used to the online environment and the things that we tried earlier there were not a lot of attendees like you, Crystal, um, but now that people are a little bit more used to this new world, uh, we're having a lot more attendance and success with the things that we're trying. So maybe it was just a matter of time, Crystal. Um, hey, this is uh, John Jackson. I'm with uh, Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. Um, hi, Crystal, from across town. <laughs> um, uh, we had some mild success with some of our asynchronous feel good finals type of stuff. So we did the color me collections where we shared JPEGs of our um, uh, archival materials that people could color and we shared uh, some library bingo cards. So we, we put those JPEGs out on our Instagram and Twitter feeds and on Instagram we got about 200 downloads uh, of each on average uh, of those two documents. Um, so that kind of stuff where we just sent it out into the ether and let people engage with it on their own time, we had the most success with that. Hi, I'm Maria Altolano from the University of North Florida in Jacksonville. And just to piggyback on what John said, hi John. Uh, the asynchronous um, move for virtual was definitely the first thing that we tried to do. We moved to remote instruction right after spring break in mid-March. So all of the events that I'd been planning for March and April flew out the window. So the easiest way for us to make the switch to virtual engagement was to do uh, asynchronous. So we did a lot of um, ask us questions, a lot of stories. Uh, we also did the bingo thing, planning another one for later this month uh, on Instagram stories. Uh, but we also did a couple contests. So one of the ways that we got students to um, just get involved, we had a haiku contest and we also did a virtual pause your stress. So we have a big event where usually 300 students come during finals week uh, and there's service dogs and training in our library. Instead, we did a kind of scavenger hunt contest with students. We had about 80 entries for that. And we had 150 entries for the haiku contest, but we offered e-gift cards to Amazon and Grubhub. So I think that's one of the reasons why we had so much involvement from students. And then after that, then we started making the move to actual synchronous virtual events. We had our first one, which was a conversations with the Dean event a couple weeks ago where we just had students and there were faculty and staff there as well uh, who just wanted to know what's going on with the library when are we going to open what is the library going to look like in the fall and the dean just you know answered questions and, and talked about processes and it went very well um, and we're planning a couple synchronous events for summer B kickoff in mid-June, including a trivia game. So making that switch from not having to worry about the Zoom or uh, like this or uh, Kahoot or something, now we get to worry about it because we know this isn't going away. But the asynchronous is a lot of fun. We're going to keep doing stuff like that. So for the Asynchronous is one of the things that as we've been planning uh, for fall is we had real 
big ideas right off the bat. We were like, we could do escape rooms and scavenger hunts. And, and immediately we had to kind of pull ourselves back and kind of refer to our outcomes for what our orientation events in the fall tend to look, look like and what we expect uh, students to learn out of that. And, you know, ultimately we started walking it back and walking it back and it's just, um, you know, we think we're probably going to do something both uh, synchronous and asynchronous uh, for, you know, a couple reasons, but we think we can do it pretty easily. Um, but we're still trying to figure out like, what's the best platform? I've, I've heard um, Zoom so far, I've heard live guides. Um, is any, do any, uh, does anybody else have any suggestions for things that they've tried, uh, different kinds of software, different kinds of platforms? Seems like no, but those are probably the go-to at this point. That's totally fine. I, like I said, this is this is pretty new. I see a, a comment in there uh, or a question asking about YouTube Live. Um, we actually uh, we used to do uh, these roundtables on YouTube Live, uh, and then it changed to something else called YouTube Studio. Uh, so it made it a little bit hard for what we were doing, but that might be an option again for uh, another possibility. YouTube Live, um, and um, you know, I, but I've, I, you know, we've been considering all kinds of things, you know, using Google Forms or Qualtrics, doing some kind of, uh, you know, activity uh, to try to keep students engaged because we're, we're a little bit, you know, we're a little bit worried that a lot of our success in the past with this in person connecting people um, to people is, is sort of our main focus in the fall is letting them know that there are librarians, that they have their own librarian, that they can get help at the library, trying not to overwhelm them. And so we're still trying to figure out how do we, how do we deliver that same kind of personal touch, same, same kind of personal um, uh, interaction uh, with our staff. Um, does anybody have any thoughts about, anybody who's done sort of the, the synchronous uh, activities any thoughts on, on on really how how to get that personal connection I mean, we've done workshops with our with our librarians i've done a few with our students and they really they really appreciate them um especially it, but like you were saying maria that they, they just having somebody tell them the things that have changed and i've updated i think they needed that in the moment and i'm worried if that how much that is going to translate in the fall when it's, you know, maybe they still will need that kind of thing or that they, but maybe they're going to be like, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't need that right now. I don't know if this, sorry, this is Liz Reardon from University of Iowa Special Collections. And I, I don't know if this answers your question exactly, but we had, we still had 33 sessions that we took part in when we went remote. Um, and a lot of those classes were meeting asynchronously. But what I found was really successful for the classes that I that I had to partake in is that I gave them something uh, like a worksheet that was kind of like a scavenger hunt that they could do asynchronously. And then I offered my services like I, I came to a open office hours, if you will, um, where they could drop in and ask me questions or talk about things that they found on their scavenger hunt or things like that to kind of provide some of that that assurance that we're still there you know in every worksheet i created for the classes i always put your number one resources the librarians i put that like five times on each worksheet with a link to our website and things like that um but i i found that doing that and offering that i actually got a lot of students to to zoom in with me uh, more than i usually do when we were still allowed on campus so uh it was it was kind of a success in a in a way Thank you, Liz. Anyone else done had success with the with interactions like this, um, getting students that are coming to you that maybe normally wouldn't have <laughs> in in person? Hi, I'm Cynthia Snyder. I'm at Midwestern University outside of Chicago. We are a graduate medical and health sciences institution. Um, 
<laughs> we're going to try uh, our, we have two programs that start in the summer, uh, physical therapy and uh, physician's assistant. And my librarian who will be doing the orientation, she lobbied to get more than the 15 minutes of, hi, I'm the librarian, here's your stuff, which you can't actually get to because you can't get in the library. She actually is having another half hour with the physical therapy students at the end of their three-day cohort orientation where she's going to have Kahoot quiz and she's going to give them more somewhere between the hi we're nice and you know they're not going to see her in class until midsummer with a specific assignment so she's going to try at the end of a long day of orientation to do something lively and yet meaningful <laughs> based on exactly what the um you know latest out of the university is because you know do you show them pictures of the stacks if they can't get to them um the the three that we actually have so um we're, we're gonna try i you know if we had another one of these i could report on how well it goes so we'll see thank you cynthia yeah that's a that's a really good point that was something we immediately were like a lot of the our interactions for the fall are we do these 10 minute quick tours we don't we bring them down the first floor give them like just the highlights things that they need to know right away most of it is based on the spaces <laughs> so you know no point in telling them well then you can study in this nice big room that you can't get into because the library is closed so we're i mean we still don't know yet but yeah that's that's something that is as we're working through it we're like well that won't make any sense or that doesn't <laughs> that doesn't factor in now so uh that's a, an excellent excellent point and yet we advertise that what 85 percent 90 percent of our services are available online i mean yeah we show them an orientation the 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 puzzle table and the you know stuff like that but i don't know that we're doing an adequate job then of explaining what we have for them because it's all virtual anyway, except that it's really boring. You know, first we have this database and then we have this database, you know, so that's where I think the, the intrigue comes in as to how to make it something they want to care about, particularly our students. Hey, Cynthia. This is uh, Megan, I'm at UNC Greensboro in North Carolina. Um, one of the ways I think that you could, because you know we've been talking about that too, you know, how are we gonna do these orientations online in the fall for new students coming in? And I think, you know, <laughs> all thanks for you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that, that one of the ways that you could possibly make that interactive is you know not necessarily oh yeah we have this database but make you could almost make it like a scavenger hunt like get on there ooh find our chat feature okay well if you're taking x class go and find you know your lib guide for that or go and find your librarian who's your librarian you know and and make those that scavenger hunt kind of an orientation to those services instead of just a Oh yeah, look at all this stuff we have online, maybe. That's what um, my librarian will be doing. She has in the past, and I think she'll do that again with this, is, is she'll do the, I'm not sure whether she'll use Kahoot or Mentimeter, but it will basically be the whole, and she's only got a half hour with them in the extra session. And it'll be, um, you know, a, a quiz but not expecting them to get the right answer, but it, as a, oh, you know, no, this is, um, is, is a way to introduce then the concept to talk about. One of them she just asked me about this morning was, do I give them the, 
you know, rank these uh, domains, uh, .com, .org, and, and .edu. Um, and whereas we've talked about what those really mean, which is very little anymore, um, it's, a, it's a basis for um, a discussion. And I think that's, that's kind of how she organizes it. Um, and so that there is, there is some more. She's even thinking about talking, you know, having them get prizes, but we don't know when they'll be back on campus. Uh, but prizes are always definitely, you know, right up there with food, which of course we can't do that either. Um, so yeah, she she's really works at making it interactive, but it's just it's so funny that it's it seems so hard that we were sitting here talking about the spaces and orientation when ugh, ours only use it as study space anyway. Um, hi, this is Randall Lopez Morgan from Louisiana State University um, in Baton Rouge. I'm the programming and outreach librarian, and. Uh, one of the, um, I don't know, people may be familiar with Middleton Library, but we have a really bad reputation for not being a good space. Um, as much as our students like use our spaces, um, we don't do a lot of orientations where they're like, oh, and this is where you study and this is the stacks because they're not very pretty to look at. And I mean, we have some great study space, but like, it's not, it's not good. Um, so the past few years our orientations are mostly about the resources that are online and we just try to make it as fun and like you know we try and throw in jokes or like you know mostly it is just getting those students to be familiar with your face and recognize that we're not robots or scary um and i just like constantly stress like oh and i even like will show them like how frustrated i can be with some of the research topics sometimes because i find that that helps them to be like okay i'm not the only one struggling here um so you know i've tried to embed like different polls or different funny like uh quizzes or just like kind of things into my research guides um not all of them but just like ones for specific classes where you know it, it reviews some of the questions that are some of the things we went over but it's not focused on our spaces because that's no one wants to see like our flooding basement and like dripping roof um so like you know it, it really is once once you kind of navigate away from the orientation space and really focus on what is online and where that is online because students, our library website is confusing and things that make sense for like me does not make sense for them and vice versa. So it's really just being like, okay, here's the website and this is where things are located and this is where I find things that are frustrating and let's talk about it. And hey, I'm just, just a reminder, I am here for your questions because things are confusing. Um, so it's just like really harping in that like, we're here to help. Our stuff is confusing. We recognize that this is what we're here for. Um, so I don't know, there's not really a program aspect to it, but um, just keep just putting that encouragement out there that it uh, those orientations will be okay after um, you get used to not being like, here's the space, because um, you don't want to show our spaces. Hi, um, I'm Amanda Roper, and I'm from um, Chat State Community College in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And back in the fall, for we worked with our um, LGBTQ plus group to do um, a zine workshop for National Coming Out Day. And so we talked about queer zines and uh, how it's a communication platform and had them all make their own zines. So we're talking about, not for the summer, because community college is a little slower in the summer and the, the classes are more compressed, um, about doing zine workshops online and then having maybe where they could pick Because I think hearing their own experiences and um, I feel like that's kind of where our library is leaning. We've got our resources and stuff, but really we're just trying to get more buy-in with our community that we understand that they have uh, unique challenges with like you know, child care being uh, around right now and lack of transportation. And so we're trying to take some of the technology scariness away and do something kind of hands-on, cut and paste, physically and gluing. So I'm, I'm hoping that will work, transitioning that very successful on ground workshop to like an online format. Yes, corn zines.
Thank you, Amanda. That's that's a really good point. It's something that I, I probably all librarians I work with are tired of me hearing, but are tired of hearing me say is I'm a, I'm a big fan about thinking about context and audience and timing and, and sort of using those as at the forefront to try to make it the, as, as successful as possible. And I, I think the considering the audience, considering what's going to might make sense at the time that you're doing it, um, you know, thinking about, uh, you were saying about uh, child care, you know, the things that are going to be in the forefront of, of their mind, um, you know, as we're, as we're planning for fall, we, again, in person, we know what they're thinking about. Other places on campus, they, they like to hand them every piece of information that they'll ever need to know for their four years at the university. And we're like, no, here's your librarian, your net ID gets you on online resources, and your your uh, uh, your ID card is how you get in the library and check out books. And then, you know, as they have questions, but we stick to those things and we find it successful, you know, it's it, that kind of keeping the context. And then for graduate students, we add a little more. We tell them the same things plus. And then for international students, what do they need to know? So it's, I think that there's, it, it's important, you know, online or in person to kind of keep that in, in mind. Um, and I think that's a great idea to to take these these really fun activities to to kind of break them in to, you know, the, to, to the library. It's like, hey, we just, you know, we're not just sitting here reading books, which is what everybody thinks, but, you know, that, that we have these fun things, but we also have all these services. I think I saw a hand go up, but maybe I was missing that. Oh, Christine. Hey, um, I, this is Christine. Um, I'm from Regent University in uh, Virginia. Um, and so all of this is actually quite interesting because we already have a very heavy online presence before all this started. Um, you know, we started off as a grad school and then moved into undergrad. So we're like 80% online before all this made us 100% uh, for the time being. But um, some of the things that I know I've been working on have just been to get engagement from the students and just to get the information out there. Um, we did a, I started a series on, um, on our Instagram called Quarren Tips. Um, I haven't gotten very far into it yet because, you know, trying to balance your actual job and your marketing side of your job is like kind of fun. Um, especially in a small library, but um, so, but the first like video actually got, um, it was, um, I wouldn't say it got a lot of traction only because we don't have a lot of Instagram followers yet, but uh, the idea behind Quarant Tips is like, you know, to have like listings of different things that like uh, with topical stuff with videos and things like that. And our first video that we went, that went out was just like, you know, different staff members kind of talking over and uh, talking to, like, letting them know, like, we're still here for them and stuff like that. Um, and I think that personal touch really does help. Um, but yeah, I don't know. That's just a thought. And I also have a question about anybody, if anybody up here has any experience with Facebook pages and that transition, let me know because I could use some help. <laughs> so. Thank you, Christine. These are these are really great ideas that are coming out. I'm, it's, it's helping me just kind of put this into perspective. Northwestern has never been set up for an online environment, and so the whole university is scrambling at, at this point. We've only have our professional programs have some online components, and but for the most part, it, it was all in person. And so, you know, we're the library isn't alone on campus trying to figure all of these things out. Um, it, one thing that we were talking about as we were planning for the fall is that in, in a way, this might give us an opportunity to actually do some sort of evaluation or assessment in a, in a, in a better way than in person. Um, you know, we, we do collect stats on our interactions 
you know, we can say this many people, we talked to this many people at our tent, we talked to this many people, um, we gave out this many librarian cards. And in the end, we, we don't, it's hard to then figure out, are they taking that card and throwing it in the garbage along with all the other stuff they get? Are they, do they come back to the librarian? So we're, we're wondering if we might actually be able to use this to see like are, is there a way to uh, use this online environment to gather more meaningful <laughs> stats <laughs> in a way, or not, I don't even want to call them stats, but information on how the, uh, about our impact in, in these orientation. Has anybody utilized this, uh, the online environment in this way to figure out if you're getting, even, whether quantitative or qualitative um, information on, on the impact uh, at all? This is probably not quite what you're asking for, but trigger this in my head. Uh, we find that our faculty are the most important people in getting our students to actually use the library. And so with all of the things changing rapidly and lots of emails going out and lots of updates, we started a digital email newsletter for our faculty and staff that we send out in an email. And it's like, this is our one email from the library. It's got everything you need. But we make um, a ridiculous meme to go at the top of the uh, uh, newsletter. And we've had faculty in the oh, I love the memes. Who makes your memes? That was a funny image. I'm like, look, we're actually getting engagement. You know who's looking at this? Like, I don't know if that's, but I hadn't thought of tracking like how our faculty is interacting with us digitally and then seeing if there's any, are we getting more people from their classes or from their departments? Um, so it was just something I had not thought of focusing on as a way to assess things. They like the Dolly Parton me. We're good. So. One thing we tried for the pathetic attempt at National Library Week this year was um, we did just a, a, a PowerPoint presentation and it was everybody's home workspaces and a little blurb about us and um, to, to tell everybody that we're still working, but we're still at home. And we got a, a, quite a bit of faculty feedback. They loved it because the idea is, well, all of us that work there are in the same place. But then we, we tried to turn it around. And the next day, we sent out an okay email, you know, um, has its drawbacks, but we reached out, tried to reach out to the students and say, since, since um, ALA switched up the, the um, instead of find your place at the library, it was, you know, find the library at your place. And so we kind of said, okay, guys, send us a, a picture, a selfie, of you in your where you're taking the library um, during this National Library Week, and we thought it sounded great, and and we said okay, and and you know the winners will get put in our. Um, we we started a gallery, uh, not of books uh, in our LibGuide, but as uh, announcements, and we're working from home and stuff like that, and we said you know. The, the winners can get, you know, their picture in this rotating gallery and we got no takers, but it sounded like a great idea. Hi, Cynthia. Um, this is Kate, a uh, medical library in Houston. Um, we did kind of the same thing, but instead of office spaces, it was showing off your new office mates, which was pets, basically, and that kind of went over better than, better than anything else. Um, uh, so just an idea. Hi, this is Allison at UMass Amherst. Um, I'm the business and entrepreneurship services librarian, and we have a research services and reference department of 12 uh, liaisons to different departments. And then beyond that, there are total 
maybe 20 liaisons. Um, so we all have different ways of interacting with our constituents because we have different types of departments and um, you know, different sizes and needs. But to answer Jason's question about um, statistics and sort of trying to get quantitative versus qualitative information, we featured as much as possible and as prominently as possible on our website, our chat feature to show that the libraries were open at least by chat from until the end of the semester, it was nine to seven. And now that it's the summer, it's nine to five, Monday through Friday. And there is always someone on the library chat ready to answer a question, any question, whether it's, you know, can I return a book? Can I have a book mailed to me? Can I find this article? You know, anything. And it's um, personed by all of the research services and liaison librarians, and then also staff um, from other departments that are helping us in those hours that librarians can't, um, that have been trained. So we have the statistics of that, and we've actually seen the chat being utilized more because it's the only way that they can reach us, at least, you know, at the beginning where they walk up to a desk and ask a question. Um, so that actually has been beneficial. We're in the midst of a beginning to redesign our website. So we're going to be doing some usability surveys and um, trying to do usability surveys over Zoom, which is going to be interesting. Um, but we're hoping to get some ideas about how to make our website more user friendly um, so that someone, I don't remember who earlier said their website is really confusing. Was it um, the Randa, sorry, from, from, uh, from Louisiana? Like no student knows how to navigate to get to my LibGuide personally other than to Google my name and there's my LibGuide, you know? Um, so getting more information from how students are using our website on a daily basis will then help inform what our website is going to look like. That was a really rambling answer. Sorry. Thank you, Allison. No, that's actually really, it's a really good point. I, you know, I tend to, because my job is very focused on engagement in a, in a particular way, but I'm also the sociology librarian. So I, I have that engagement as well. And I, yeah, we've seen the same thing. I mean, our, our chat stats have gone through the roof. Uh, we've seen a lot of, I, I've seen a lot of direct interaction. I've talked to faculty that, you know, I've talked to the department many times and all of a sudden I'm hearing from all these faculty I've never heard from in years <laughs> and, and now, which is great. And they're, but they're, and it's that they're calling on things uh, both in chat and just, and I've heard this from other, our other liaisons as well, is that they're, they're getting questions that are things that they have told people they do. But I think the necessity of now, well, people could tend to just get around it in their own way of working, you know, whether it was going to the library or doing these things. And now everybody's kind of in the same boat. They don't, I used to do it this way and now I can't, and now I have no idea what to do. And now there's a person, even if they knew I existed before, it's like, oh, well, this person can tell me and which is great. And that's, we are, so we're, right now we're like, we got to collect these stats now because, <laughs> you know, also facing budget issues at our university and that this is the kind of thing they need, but it's, so it's great. Um, but I think that's, it's a good point. I mean, I think that, it, you know, thinking about usability, just even in the planning of, of any kind of outreach activity or program is, you know, it's, I, I think going back to what we were talking about earlier is that in person, you, you kind of know how to do that. Uh, you know, you can, but now, now you're dealing with Zoom, you're dealing with live guides, you're dealing with your website, you have all these different formats that you're trying to, you know, before you could do like Randa, you were saying, you're like, well, I know how to use it and I could tell somebody how to do it. But now it's like, but not everybody's going to ask. And, and now, now even more so, we can't even see them <laughs> so, necessarily. So I think that's an excellent point um, is, you know, tracking those things and maybe using them as, as um, uh, ways to help develop other programs. I think something that has been helpful, and I think, um, I don't know about you all, but I'm burnt out on Zoom, I'm burnt out on working from home. I miss going to work. I never thought I'd actually say that, but I miss physically leaving my house and driving the 20 minutes to campus and, and you know, navigating parking and all. I miss it. <laughs> but 
one of the things that our dean has done is he has requested all of us submit success stories to him whether it's literally just you know a faculty member said thank you to me for helping them find an article um, ILL helped me get chapters from an ebook because we couldn't buy the ebook on, you know, Gobi or whatever. Um, and, and unfortunately, not everyone has submitted. He put that call out at the beginning of all of this. So I'm sure that those stories have trickled down to nothing. But it would be good if he put that call out again because when he goes to meetings with deans and higher ups and, and they need stories about what the library is doing and how the library is working, he can cite those stories and say, well, Allison was able to find this amazing thing for a professor that they didn't know that they could find until they talked to the library. And here's the proof, here's the professor's name, and here's the steps of what happened. Um, so maybe that's something that your libraries could do is start collecting the success stories that are happening remotely, not just for stats purposes, but to show that you're still working and that you're still making a difference, even if you're not, you know, in person and physically driving the work. <laughs> That's something my department head has been very uh, big on is uh, I, I tend to be a, a I record my stat. I'm probably they use me as a baseline because I'm like just religiously. I think because I used to have to manage that stuff, so I always. But we we have the same problem. I'm sure everybody does that. Not everybody enters these things, and it's like we know that people are doing work, and it would be helpful. But I like the idea of calling them success stories. Is these these gathering this information that is not just a tick mark or something in you know in live insight to you know just track numbers but to get those actually those those thank yous um and that yeah that's something my supervisor has been very big on but success with getting a lot of people on board with it is it's like well then i gotta go through my email it's like well <laughs> we're trying to prove a point here <laughs> do a search for thank you that's that, that's probably do it any other thoughts on assessment kelly i see you um, this is not about assessment, but something somebody said made me think about this. Um, we're going to have a virtual retreat because one of the things we are concerned about is that we'll lose all of the good stuff that we've um, encountered during this time. And you know how you you go through something and you think well when things get back to normal i am not going to stop doing xyz and then you get back to normal and xyz falls off your plate so we were wanting a way as a staff to try to discuss and remember all of these things that were positives that had occurred during this time and so the way we're going to do that is through a virtual retreat and we're going to have it's going to sort of revolve around three questions like what is um what is something that has that you created or thought of during this time that should carry over into the future um and then we have two other questions and we are also going to bring in lunch because by this time we'll be back in the building but we'll all be in our offices attending this retreat and so they are going to bring in lunch so you can go down and get your lunch and go back to your office but the day will also be broken up with some fun activities as well and so attending the three discussion questions will be mandatory but the other stuff will not be but we just wanted a way to sort of uh reflect and not forget the good that has come the good things and try to incorporate those once things get back to normal the success stories is what made me somebody said something about success stories that's what made me think of that thank you kelly any other thoughts on that Okay, we're getting down to the last 15 minutes here and I, you know, I've kind of run through my questions. I think most of the things that we had to talk about were uh, addressed in one way or another, but I want to throw it open. If anybody had any very specific questions that they, they were thinking about that they want to throw out there. 
Um, this is Janae. Oh, sorry. Did you have a hand raised? Oh, go ahead, Janae. Oh, well, um, real quick, I'm from the University of Iowa, and we are trying to partner with our TRIO Upward Bound program, and they are going to an all-virtual summer program of their own. And we are trying to, uh, I'm meeting with one of the staff members, and we're trying to figure out how the library can still be a part of this since we had started talking about this last winter. And at this point, I really don't know what that's gonna look like. And it sounds like currently it's gonna be perhaps a video orientation of us talking, a couple of us, about the library's resources. But I also have the problem of some of these students actually don't have any, won't have any um, access to their resources because they're gonna still be in high school. And um, typically I think they, they might if they're coming in onto campus, but now since it's online, they don't have access. So I'm trying to figure out if there's any way that we can even build a guide. It could be like a live guide of open access resources of things they can at least access. And I wonder if anybody had any other thoughts or similar issues that they're gonna be partnered with summer programs. Um, hi, this is Julia Eisenstein. I'm the business librarian from the University of Detroit Mercy. And we have that problem too. We've got, um, high schoolers who come on campus for camps and you know they'll be doing it online and typically what I've done is a LibGuide and they can access the LibGuide from anywhere with open access resources but I also recommend to them that if they belong to a public library they have access to public library databases um, so I just you know sometimes I can find out where these kids are from. If they're from Detroit, they've got access from the Detroit Public Library databases and I'll direct them that way as well. That's a great idea, thank you. Um, I just put in the chat, uh, we, we put together a, a guide for free scholarly resources because we run into this problem with our alumni who are as soon as they leave, they don't have access anymore, and then they, they're very upset. So we, you know, usually we put together this guide, it's multidisciplinary, just points to a lot of open access materials that you can access. But that's something that we also encourage people is to, to look towards uh, public libraries as well. Uh, my name is Brianna Hughes. I'm the faculty instruction and outreach librarian for a really small liberal arts college um, in Baltimore, uh, Stevenson University. And I was wondering if anyone has kind of done the opposite of what we've all talked about and really scaled back their outreach events and programming. Um, our student activities office on campus, along with a, a bunch of other offices and departments have really gone above and beyond what they normally do, offering fun activities virtually for students. And when I spoke with my director kind of early on um, during our stay at home, and we talked about what we wanted to do and what we wanted to offer, we decided that instead of kind of saturating the market even more, um, we would kind of hold off on doing any programming and really focus more on our traditional services um, and our social media presence. Um, so I'm just curious if anyone has made that decision and kind of decided I'm not going to try to, you know, reinvent the wheel when so many others are offering these same ideas. And I think it's actually turned out for the better because I know that attendance has been really low at those virtual events that, that our student activities office has done. So I kind of feel justified in my reasoning for that, but I'm just curious if anyone else has experienced that as well. Me, I said before, haven't been trying to pull back, but more so identify partnerships with those people. So if they're, you know, if they have a built in core group of people that are already coming, or if we do, or thinking about how we can sort of combine our forces to make sure that um, there's still some kind of presence uh, with both uh, departments uh, being able to reach out to students. So we also had similar issues like we um we're very we do lots of lot, lots of like on campus programs and um when we went remote um we actually went from 
the last night that students were on campus, we actually had a program that night. And then after that, um, every time I like reached out to faculty or staff or students, it really just seems like their whole focus was just getting to the end of the semester. Like normally I would be getting emails from faculty and staff and, and this time it was just very, I mean, just dead silence. And I was getting some emails, but it just wasn't the same. Um, and so we tried to put together a programming, um, a guide that had some fun resources for students during finals week. Um, it got very low hits. Um, and I think part of that is we're all kind of experiencing that Zoom burnout um, and that, like that like interaction virtually. Um, but we also are trying to figure out ways in the fall that we can at least attempt to do a couple of things um, just to say that, like, hey, we tried it. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But um, yeah, we've been kind of experiencing that same thing. It's, it's almost a little discouraging because you want to do all these events that you normally do, but the students just, yeah, and maybe it could be because they're just not getting used to it. I've wrote that as my little notes. Um, maybe now that they're used to it, we might get more responses, but we were having the same problem early on. I can jump in one more second. Uh, I think another thing that we're thinking about is uh, the timing. One thing that we realized was we were doing this during finals study days and that wasn't necessarily the time that a lot of students would necessarily need to come to the library unless they were needing us to help them with citations or what have you. So thinking about um, the point of like the time of need and if we should post something back earlier so that when they're working on final papers or when they really need to come to the library, then we have an event that's specifically geared and targeted towards those specific things that they need. Uh, and then trying to think about when we first come back to campus, come back to campus virtually probably, uh, is whether or not we want to wait until after all of the orientation events have already sort of died down so that once everyone has already done all of their other orientation events, we can say, oh, okay, so now that you had all this other information thrown at you, now come and take a look at what the libraries has to offer. So we're sort of thinking about how we might be able to um, market around those specific timeframes as well. That's a really good point, Crystal. I, I, I agree. I think that's where we, we would have programs all year long and we had to basically just not do a bunch of them. And it did become a, a matter of prioritizing what people needed at that, at that time. And so looking ahead towards the fall when we've already said, okay, well, this is one of our flagship things that we do. We can't do it then. It won't make sense. We're going we're gonna to have to look, let's look towards winter. We don't want to drop it. People actually look forward to, but let's, let's see if there's a different time of year to, to, to run something like that. And I think uh, what Crystal said about partnerships too, is I, that's something we, that's our main focus is creating relationships across campus to, to do things so that we're not duplicating efforts or, and, or tapping it, being able to tap into other audiences uh, directly. So we're still relying on that. It's a little bit, it's been a little bit harder than it normally is. Uh, we still have some really great partners that are just engaged with us all the time. And then we have others who we've had good relationships with that are like, I do not have the bandwidth right now. And so we're, we're kind of like playing that game of like, oh, okay, we'll give you some time, but at a certain point, we're going to need to know, we're going to need an answer or like, it's fine. We understand, but we need to, we need to know. So yeah, it's, uh, but calling on partners is usually, uh, is, is a, is a good way to, you know, uh, not put as much effort into something that in the end gets two people and then you're like, ah, <laughs> that, that didn't work, but. Okay, we're down to the last five minutes and I, I wanna be conscious of everybody's time. Uh, do we have uh, any, any last thoughts, any last questions that people wanna throw out? I just have one last question real quick and I'll try to make it fast. Um, we do a lot of outreach with our robust senior citizens on, uh, in Iowa City, um, but moving forward and going into this virtual age, it, you know, a lot of them aren't really comfortable using computers or, or kind of more technology. And I was wondering if anyone um, has suggestions or ideas about how to reach out to to senior citizens um, as a part of outreach because they also really 
enjoy our programming and I feel like it's more important than ever to reach out to them in this time of quarantine. So um, I don't know if anyone has any ideas, but I would greatly appreciate it. Uh, this is Karen Howell from uh, USC. Um, I'm the head of Libby Library and Crystal is our uh, super uh, librarian there. Uh, I think, do you have anything like an emeriti center of any sort? Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, USC or emeriti center before the pandemic had uh, partnered with our undergraduate student government. So they were having some I don't remember the name, it's something like intergenerational something or other, but they had uh, uh, joint meetings where these student volunteers were coming in and showing the seniors how to use technology and they had uh, like potlucks uh, so that they could share their stories with each other. Uh, after the pandemic hit, uh, you know, I still get messages because I'm on the Emeriti Center uh, email list just as a potential partner. Uh, they uh, seem to be trying to switch online. That helped because they already did have some established relationships uh, with the uh, students that might be more tech savvy. And there are some senior citizens are more tech savvy and interested too. Uh, so maybe you can try and identify if there were any existing uh, relationships or some existing knowledge in that senior group. I, I'm not sure uh, if it will completely help, but it gives you something to work with. Now that's a great idea, Karen. Thank you. And Ruth, I see your comment too, and that's also a really good idea. So I'm writing those both down. Thank you. Hey, all there's um, some great comments and ideas in uh, the in the chat session. I would love to get a transcript of that if that's possible after this is done. Yeah, I, th I was just looking at that. I, th I think we can save the chat transcript. Um, at the very least, we can uh, either make that available or we can throw them into the notes because we're going to, as Kristen's been taking notes, we can add those uh, to the documents. And uh, what we, we do is after all three sessions, we'll have a compiled just one document with all the notes from all three sessions so that, that people can see if, if, if you're not at the other ones, get that information as well. Um, thank you all. This was really great. I, I wasn't sure how it was going to go with 50 plus participants, but this was wonderful. Thank you for contributing your ideas and your, your questions. Um, and uh, so we will be doing a session tomorrow and a session Thursday. And then we will be posting the uh, the notes, and uh, I believe we're going to get the recordings as well to post on uh, ALA Connect uh, or a that for Academic Outreach Committee. Um, so, thank you again. Stay healthy, stay safe, um, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, we uh, you can send it. Uh, let me get the email address. Uh, which I don't have. Hey, Kristen, do you happen to have it handy? <laughs> Kristen's going to post the email address for our committee. If you have any follow-up questions, uh, please feel free to uh, uh, send us an email.